All right, welcome to the second session in the research breakout room at Soybean Summit. My name is Jennifer Jones. I'm the research agronomist here for the Illinois Soybean Association and happy to see you all today. I'm pleased to introduce this session speaker, Dr. Connor Sibyl from the University of Illinois here in Urbana-Champaign. Dr. Sibyl's interests are in high yield corn and soybean production systems with a range of different approaches. Prior to starting a postdoc, his previous research focused on categorizing biological products and in understanding where, how, and why they work to improve fertilizer use efficiency and increase crop yields. Dr. Sibyl's current research still touches these topics, but has added a focus on crop residue management and genetic by management interactions. So today, Dr. Sibyl will discuss the latest findings from the University of Illinois Crop Physiology Lab related to soybean planting dates, cover crops and double crop management, and optimizing fertilizer use efficiency to bring yield and ROI to soybean production. Before Dr. Sibyl comes up, just as a reminder, if you have questions during the Q&A period, uh, please use the microphone to ask your questions so those online can hear it as well. Thank you, and I'll invite Dr. Sibyl up to the stage. All right, good afternoon. Well, that was great, first try. You guys are ready to go. All right, we really appreciate the opportunity to be here um, and to talk about soy soybean success. And we'll get into why, you know, no longer a secret because I think many of you that may not know who I am probably know who I work with. And that's Dr. Fred Bilo. Uh, I did all my grad work with Dr. Bilo, and in the very last year of my PhD, decided I want to try academia rather than industry. And apparently there's a different route of training to be a professor versus an industry agronomist. And so I am now what is called a postdoc. We're about a month after the holidays, and I just got done telling all my family and explaining to them what a postdoc is. Right, so they're like, oh, you've graduated, so you're teaching now? Nope. But you don't take classes, you're not a student. Nope. And there's an awkward pause, and they're like, so what do you do? Right? And so postdoc is a lot of research, um, but the way I kind of say it's professor in training. So eventually, someday, I do hope to be an extension specialist at some uh, university working in row crop production. And my master's and PhD work was all focused on this biological biostimulant market. It's a booming bust. We can talk about that another day. But what I'm really excited about in my postdoc role, I've been able to expand and look at some more broader topics. And today, I'm going to bring you some of the things about soybean. And specifically, I'm not going to give you anything that's just, wow, brand new, out of the blue. Like a lot of what we're going to talk about is things you've probably already known. But things that are good reminders. Why are we doing these things? And what are we seeing in recent years to continue building upon those and making sure the practices we implement are indeed a success and not a random luck of the draw secret? So I kind of want to start with a question. Is soybean currently managed adequately? Or if we rephrase the question, are we achieving full yield potential? See, if you're shaking heads, you, you, you know where this is going, right? So what is full uh, yield potential, right? And what might be the world recognized, right? There's, there's studies out there that do theoretical yields. What a soybean or corn plant could produce theoretically, but we live in the real world where we have to put them out in the environment and into soils, and there's a, a realized yield goal. And so that would be the world soybean record, and then the soybean yield gap would be the difference between the record and the average. Right? And so when we look at the soybean yield gap, the world record actually is now 207 bushels per acre. And that came out of Georgia. Right? Actually, a lot of our high record corn soybean yields come from the East Coast. So why not the I states for these records? Well, sometimes, you know, we blame things like clouds and such. But the other thing you have to remember there on some sandy soils where any nutrition they put out either goes up into the crop or down through the system. So a little different there on fertility management that helps them. Uh, they're also on the coastline. That cool ocean breeze has a big influence on the end of season grain development and some other factors. But that's the world record, right? So that's the potential that has been realized today. While the US average is about 52 bushels, that was in 2016. I don't think the US average has gone above that across the state. You know, Illinois, number one. And if you look at the uh, records, we did get 65 bushels on average across the state in 2021. Right? But if you do the difference between the, the maximum and the average, that's 155 bushels. That's the yield gap. Now, I truly don't think we're going to get the average to 207. But the gap is currently three times 
our current average. That, to me, is something we can change. If we can get the average equal to the gap, that's significant progress, and that'll bring some real value to the farm and to our fields. So how do we get there? You know, I, I started out as an engineer. For those that don't know my background, my freshman year I was going to be ag engineer and work on combines for John Deere, right? Um, that's a lot of math and a lot of computer and computing, and I learned that real fast and jumped to biology in the spring semester. Uh, and then I found out there's math and biology too, but it's not quite as hard, right? So we do have algorithms, and so here's the soybean yield algorithm. It's pod number per acre, right? It's not plants per acre, darn things branch. And so it's pod number per acre, seeds per pod, weight per seed. Seems pretty simple, doesn't it? When we think about these, what can we control over? Seeds per pod, right? If you're really high management, you might be able to get that a little higher, but that's largely genetically constrained. So what we can control is pod number per acre and weight per seed. And when you think about pod number per acre, that's the first half of the season. Weight per seed is the second half of the season. Rule number one for successful soybean yield, season long management. If you start out strong, don't give up or think eh, it's gonna do fine the rest of the way. I gave it the start it needed. I'm gonna go on vacation. True high yield is a season long commitment. If you set the pod number, now you gotta make sure you fill them because if you have more mouths to feed, uh, that's more, things, more food input to feed them if you want them all to be the same level of full. We went back and Marcos Lohman, he's not here right now, he's a grad student in our lab and he looked at a lot of our untreated control data over time and just looked at these yield components to yield. And so this is a massive correlation, pretty tight, you know, there's 13, almost 1,300 different data points on this. And what you can see is that grain yield of soybean changes uh, linearly, positively, with seed number. So if we're seeing higher yields, it's probably because you have more pods or nodes, and those nodes have pods, right? You saw some fantastic photos, and those beans were just loaded with pods. And then the second half is the seed weight. And you'll see that it's kind of correlated to yield, but really it's seed number. So most of our management is ensuring we grow a solid soybean plant that puts on the nodes and the pods, and here's the hardest part to it all. You gotta keep those pods. Soybean is lazy. And it will set a very high number of pods and say, all right, I gave myself the potential, but I'm a low achiever. I can cut half of those away and still be fine. Biology re reproduce, right? So seed number more than seed weight drives yield. So how do we manage these factors? And that's where we have the six secrets of soybean success, right? These are the factors that can have the biggest impact on yield. And anyone that's heard Dr. Bilo speak, you've heard this before, right? We're beating this puppy to death, but it works. And guess what? This was put out in 2012. And when I've been thinking about the last 12 years or 11 seasons, now going into our 12th year, 2024, um, it's the same factors. So the factors themselves have not changed. And the cool thing about this is there's nothing on this list that is really out of reach for all of our acres, except maybe this last one, the row spacing on here. Um, we brought that down a little bit on this list because uh, we can see that a lot of these other ones are a little more easier to manage. No equipment change on that. And then here's just a different variety photo. So what we're going to kind of do is just review, right? 2012 is when Dr. Bilo put these out. And we've kind of revamped it with what we know now. And that's what I want to do today is go through our updated findings the last two to three seasons that are more rele relevant to today's genetics and weather. Uh, and you can actually see if we reorder these for today, row spacing has gone up on our list a little bit. They shuffle. So the first thing I'm gonna put there is the weather. We estimate about a 35 bushel of difference or not. That was, you know, on the farmer panel. What's the one thing, control the controllables that we discussed, can't control the weather, right? I wish we could. But weather is more, you know, when people ask, why is, why is planting date not on here? Because it's controlled by the weather. So you can kind of lump planting date and weather together. And it's been a hot topic, right? And I think if you follow the report, the general consensus is plant early. There's been enough studies, enough people doing that, myself included, to see that advantage, and we're gonna talk about that. But what we wanna talk about now, okay, if you're planting in April today, but four years ago we're planting in late May after corn, should you manage your April soybeans the exact same way you manage the May soybean? And our hypothesis was probably not. So understanding now that we've changed how we plant, we probably have to change how we manage. Um, so, you know, this is just an example 2019 Champaign, May 15th, not a single plot went in the ground for us. Planting dates were late. I think our first corn trial went in the ground May 30th, 
Uh, it, was a, it was a brutal planning season for us on the research side. I think we put all our plots out in the first two weeks of June for the most part. But one of our former students went back and looked at all our control yields over time and the date they were planted and plotted that on a chart. And so here they are. You can see the different years that those different control yields came from. And then the Julian day or the respective year, day of the year on the bottom axis. And you do a simple regression on this and you more or less get about a loss of a half a bushel per acre per day for every day after April 23rd. Now why April 23rd? Because when he put this data set together, we had never planted earlier than that in our research program. And we just assume that line probably keeps going. We're going to talk about that moving forward. But this really opened our eyes. And so to go after this, we developed a trial started last season, or two seasons ago, 2022, into 2023, that starts with planning eight and then all the other factors we can think about to manage with that. Here's an example uh, in the background. You can see we had different blocks. So here's our early planning starting to mature, and then our late planning, they're a little bit behind. So in 2022, here's a graph of the percentage of soybean acres planted over time for the state of Illinois. And you can see, you know, we were about, what, 50% third week of May. So either our first half of May or after May for soybean. And what's going on in this phase right here, up in this white space? Probably planting your corn, right? So the, the corn graph is the inverse. Corn acres, you know, really start high if you think about it, and then it comes together. And so we did a first planting date that year was um, early or late April, and then we came back early May, late May, and June. So this is where our planting dates stacked up respective to the rest of the state, uh, and specifically for us, those dates that in 2022 were April 23rd. Right, coincidentally, the same date that was on that regression graph uh, just happened to be the first day we could get in the field that year. May 9th, 31st, June 15th, and then a bunch of different managements within this, and we duplicated this on the other side. And I'm going to skip a little bit of the in-season and just jump right to what everyone always likes to see, right? What were the yields? Uh, and pretty straightforward. As you planted earlier, you got more yield. Actually, April 23rd to June 15th was a 20 bushel yield difference. Now this is the part that I said a lot of us are starting to realize the potentials there, but what's going on in the background, right? I've got physiology on my shirt. So where is the yield coming from and why did I start off with our soybean yield algorithm? When you look at these photos, right, here's the different planning dates, April 23rd versus May 9th. That's taken on June 15th. That's the date that the fourth planning date went in the ground. And here's May 9th versus May 31st, and then May 31st versus June 15th, right, just went in. Now, you want to be over here on June 15th, or would you like to see your beans over here? And what's going on is this develops through the season, right? What's really interesting, the April 23rd, May 9th, were almost indistinguishable by July 31st, right, well into R3 onto these two planning dates. Huge difference, though, just from May 9th to May 31st. And then look at where our June soybean were. The other thing we were was dry. The emergence on that June planting date was all over the board. I had some V4 beans and some just coming out of the ground because the rain finally came to get them out. So understanding planting depth and making sure those beans get into moisture. We learned that lesson by using a uniform planting date or depth across this study in 22, 2023. I changed that planting date as that or the depth as the date changed. But just some visuals. But when you really peel it back, you can see the individual plants and you remove the leaves. It tells the story. All right, so on July 31st, that first planting date had 21 nodes, and I had 20 nodes, 17 nodes, and 12 nodes. Now, the good news is these two down here on the end, they keep growing. So they didn't stop at 12 nodes, but at July 31st, right, what do we always say? Beans are made in August. Going into August, I'd rather have 20 nodes on the plant than 12 and not be trying to play catch up. Then you do the math. Uh, we planted these at 140,000 plants per acre. And so the total nodes now are 2.9 million nodes, 2.8, 2.4, and 1.7. And then you compare the difference of the April to the June, and I would have needed to have 245,000 plants per acre here to have the same number of nodes. So soybean yield and seed number is not necessarily how many plants you have out there, it's how many nodes per acre that you're working with. And these were main stem nodes. We did not count branch nodes in this, so that probably makes it even different. But this is why soybean yield, driven by seed number. And then once you've got them, you have to then look at managing for seed weight. Comes back to this equation and where we go. 
And then this is just, you know, happily, a little bit before my time, we probably need to update these numbers, but grad students love to do fun, boring, meticulous tasks, right? Nothing a grad student loves to do more than start counting nodes on soybean. Maybe root digging corn, right? Maybe that's a little bit on their, their priority list. Um, but when you count, you can see the node number on the bottom and the number of um, pods per node and where we sit there in the peak is in the middle of the plant. So most of our yield is in the middle nodes of the plant. So when we think about going from 50 bushels to 60 or 70, where are we going to add the pots? Are they going to be at the top of the plant or the bottom of the plant? Right, where do we have more room? Spoiler alert, when we counted those, they're still in the middle. Right, maybe we move a little bit, one node north and one node south, but the bulk of soybean yield is in the middle. And actually at 140,000 plants per acre, one more pod per plant is just two more bushels. Seems easy, right? All you gotta do is get every plant out there to put on one more pod, and you get two bushel advantage. Easier said than done. But this is why seed number is driving yield, and we have to manage for that. And one way to do that is planning date. Uh, so we did it again in 2023 though, right? Like anything in research, one time's not good enough. You gotta repeat, be sure, consistent. So here's the percentage of soybean planting in 2023. And the thing you'll note, we hit 50% here before May 10th, well ahead of 2022. I've been working with Dr. Bilo for seven years. Best planting conditions I've ever had to work with. Seed beds were beautiful. That crop was off to a great start. So our first date was actually um, April 12th was the first date we went this year. We beat last year by 11 days. And then we came in uh, May 4th, May 23rd, and June 14th. So pretty good spread though to across the two years. So how did it yield in 2023? And sure enough, earlier planting, higher yield. And some of you that have better eyesight, right? You caught right away, I'm hiding something from you. Right, so is early planting always a guarantee for higher yields? Sadly, it wasn't in this case for us. A lot of different things going into that. We're still looking in the yield components ourselves, processing those over the winter to figure out what happened to lose it. But the key thing here is, you know, May 4th, that's still pretty early considering a lot of people are still focused on corn at this point. But what's going on here? And I don't know if anyone else probably ran into the same problems I did. I've never seen this in a couple of years. That's me going out 13% beans, 10% by the end of the day. There's a lot of green there. And this is what we had. Those pods were dry. Actually, some of them, we waited as long as we could, but the pods started to open up, and then you're just losing beans, so you have to try, and we did. And so a couple factors probably here uh, mitigating it. When we go in too early, do we get off to a good start, the drought hits and it crashes harder? What I think we have a source sink issue. We set a high potential with the early, but something in the season, the drought or the conditions at planting when we went that early, meant we didn't have the sink, but we had all that nitrogen and leaves had nowhere to go, green stem big issue for us on this planting date, and that's what we lost. But the key thing for the last two years that we've learned is that the earliest planting may not always win, but the potential it can bring with relative little risk is worth the try, because we still pulled 73 bushel beans. That's still a pretty good day. Now last year it was, I think, 78, 79, but 70 north of 70, and then we can get the advantage. You know, I think there's some work being done now. A little bit later planted corn is not the worst thing. As long as your RM isn't too high and you get frost killed, there's advantage to having corn grain fill with cooler nights if you push that a little further into fall. And so maybe there's a dual, dual potential here. You gain some yield by the beans going earlier. Maybe you gain a few bushels on the corn going a little later because you've pushed their grain fill into a little bit cooler nights. Hot nights on grain fill for corn just eats yield away. So this is what we're starting to see in our research here. These are all done in Champaign and Campus. So local planning date data for you. Um, and one of the things that I kind of, you know, it's February 1st, right? So what's tomorrow? Groundhog Day, right? February 2nd, right? We're about to know how much more winter we have. And that's the traditional question, right? So when we talk to Mr. Bill Murray, he's wondering to know how many more weeks of winter do we have? But I'm getting excited about some of the other ways we could rephrase this question. Maybe this is not the question we need to be asking. Maybe when we talk to Phil here, it should be something like this. Soybean goes in the ground early this year. 
Is the groundhog going to determine not more weeks of winter, but how soon till you better have that planter ready to roll? Just something to go from there, some things that we're excited about, but understanding it's not always a guarantee win. So that's weather, the planting date, and some other things going on. But the thing that I mentioned, based on April or June, how do you manage that crop? How do you maximize the profitability of the inputs you could put in? Genetics and variety, 25 bushels. So I'm gonna show you a trial from 2021 where we had 26 varieties, and this is just standard management. 30 inch row, plant them, walk away, right? Make sure there's no weed pressure. And here's the different 26 varieties, going from one to 26, highest yield on the top left, lowest yield on the bottom right. Now I'm still happy at 73 bushels, right? But if I had selected a different variety, could have been out just over 100. And that is a 27.6 bushel range, purely by variety selection. Now to protect the innocent, I'm not gonna tell you who's at the top and who's at the bottom, but there is a pretty consistent trend we see with how do you more so lean towards being in this first column with your variety selection than your last column. And we're gonna do a little bit of more of a regression, and I'm gonna take the yields of those planting dates and break them out by maturity group. So in these planting dates, both years, we had 16 different varieties that ranged from a 2.7 to a 4.2, or I think we may have had a 4.4 in that first year. Quite a big maturity group spread for one location. And so when the regression here, this is what it looked like for the April, and I can tell you that this out here is a little bit of an outlier. That bean was a 2.7, it matured fast, we couldn't get the combine in fast enough, we had pods cracking open. But there's a pretty clear trend, as the maturity group gets longer, the yields go up. If you look at this regression, that number in front of the X would claim 14 bushels for every increase in one maturity group. Now again, like I said, that's biased by this a little bit. But when we look at May 9th, right now it's about 10 bushels. May 31st, it's about three bushels for every increase in maturity group, and then we're four bushels. So maybe there's a point where it maxes out. But the key point, even if you remove these two points here, the longer maturity group for the given planting date tends to be higher yielding. And on those 26 varieties, I can tell you, the high threes and low fours were in the first column, and the low threes and high twos were in that last column. Huge advantage. So in this year, on average, which every one increase in maturity group was worth eight bushels. So what did that look like in 2023? In this case, we're just gonna put all the data points into one regression and put the line through the middle. And you can see, you've got the bottom planning date, the middle one, they're color-coded. So our, our first, pla second planning date is in the orange there up on the top. And when you look at this one, and you look at that number up there, it's not as strong, but again, the same trend. One increase in maturity group was worth four bushels. 2023. That's a difference from planning a 3-0 versus a 4-0 on the same day. So in general, if you're thinking about variety selection, longer maturity group, don't be afraid to push it a little bit. Now I know there's situations where you might need an early bean so you can one, start harvest a little early, get some acres going, get the combine, make sure it's all ready to go. If you're cover cropping, there's an advantage to getting some of those beans out earlier to get a cover crop. So I understand that every situation is there, but in general, if you're used to a 3.3, why not try 3.5s? If you're used to 3.5s, why not try a 3.7 or a 3.8? And if that one change might give you two bushels uh, increase, that's a positive gain without having to change much on the farm. Um, next, we're gonna jump into row spacing a little bit, right? We put nine bushels on there. We know this changes year to year. Um, when we're planting earlier, we don't see as big of an advantage. But I'm gonna summarize, it's going back a little bit, right? So 30 inch rows and 20 inch rows. You can just see canopy closure. A little more elbow room within the row. And we did a lot of trials on this, so I'm gonna take us back a little bit, but it's the average of 11 trials from 2014, 2015. And that's why I like this data set, because it's the average of 11, and we got a quite good consistent response. And so here we have 30 inch row on top, uh, narrow row, 20 inches for us. We, we do 20s because of research equipment. We assume 20 inch would be similar to a 15 inch row. And you can see we had a six bushel advantage in these trials, seed number. Give the beans a little more elbow room. They tend to branch a little bit more. Put a few more pods on. So row spacing is helping you get seed number. And then things like foliar protection help fill those seeds seed weight. So we really like row spacing, but we understand the equipment constraints. So it's not like that's the only thing you have to do to get more yields. That's why we kind of started with just planting date and maturity group. Some simple things anyone can do on any acre. We are gonna talk about foliar protection. And one thing I'm gonna say right off the bat, I am in the high yield game. 
I understand there are IPM discussions we have to have as well, disease pressure thresholds, right? If we overuse these things, we get into resistance, and then they're no longer an effective tool. But one of the challenges on the yield side with fungicide is whether there's disease or not, there is a plant health effect that causes a stay green effect, right? So in this case, we usually pair insecticide uh, and fungicide together. If you're paying for the application cost, put both products together. And you can just see you're protecting, as we heard earlier this morning that I very much agree with, solar panels, not leaves, solar panels, right? If you got solar panels, you got a hailstorm, take out a bunch of spots on the panel, that's not a good investment. If you got something feeding on your beans, now they're putting holes in your solar panels. So you're losing yield there. So big proponent for what potential foliar protection can do. And then this is just going later in the season, that stay green effect. And like I said, it's a challenge because we know on the yield side, there's almost always a benefit given disease pressure and in the presence of disease, much higher. But it's a balance that we have to strike. And what's really interesting when we look about this where is that yield coming from, right? Because foliar protection is typically around here, one pass, probably R3, right? I know some progressive systems are looking at multiple. One pass, R3, where is that time-wise? Second half of the season. So now this is where that whole thing comes to, yield is season long. So at the time the fungicide goes out, you've already set the seed number potential with pods and nodes. And now you have to influence on seed weight. So the average soybean seed weight is about 150 milligrams. And if you can increase the seed weight two milligrams, that's one bushel. Again, seems pretty simple, right? That's less than a percent, or percent and a half, sorry. See, I told you I wasn't good at math. Um, but when we look at those same 11 trials and the value of foliar protection, we see about a three bushel advantage in these years. It's now a result of seed weight. Here it's almost a little under one to one ratio. Foliar protection, second half of the season, seed weight. Soybean yield is season long management. So then the question though, I can tell you these trials were all pretty well planted after May 10th, when most growers had traditionally been planting soybean. So what's the foliar protection story on those April beans? Maybe we need to change the timing, go out a little earlier, things like that. Well, we predicted that the later soybean might need the foliar protection because they already have a shorter se season. If you can give them stay green in a little longer season, they're going to see the best benefit. Also, they're probably going to be at the worst time of disease pressure and making flowering and pod decisions, whereas the April beans, they might be about tapped out by the time the disease pressure comes in. And shockingly, for the 2022 data, it was always a benefit to the foliar protection, R3, fungicide, insecticide. If you look across this on average, it was worth 3.25 bushels in 2022, really close to that 3.3 that I just showed. And in a higher disease pressure year, right, drought year, no disease, I expect that probably would double, sometimes in really bad situations, triple. So what do we see this following year when we do the exact same thing, same trial approach? And here it is, and you break it out, 2023. And if you look at these differences across planning dates, on average this year, it was 4.4 and a quarter in the absence of disease. So foliar protection for us in our studies is protecting the yield potential and making sure you fill those seed weights. Early planting, right maturity group, that's pods and nodes. Now you need to protect the pods and nodes. Don't give up on them. And in a dry year especially, I think a lot of people may have looked out in June and said, crop's going to do what it's going to do. I'm, I'm done. I don't want to put more money into it. And this might show probably still could have gotten some advantage to it. Um, and, and I'd have to talk the economics on it. We're probably close to break even on this with beans and, and prices change from year to year. But foliar protection for us in general seems to be a pretty consistent win, regardless of planting date. What about fertility, right? So here we've now kind of attributed fertility to four uh, bushels, and there's some interesting things going on. But when I, when I want to remind you about fertility in soybean, what's the number one nutrient we typically throw out there for soybean? Potassium. Why do we talk about potassium so much for soybean? Well, if you look at the removal rates, I'm an optimistic guy, right? So our current state record is 65 bushels. I'm going for 80. So I'm going to put these up also because I think this is the future. In five to 10 years, I think most of us are going to be talking 80 bushel beans uh, in certain areas. And so we want to look at these numbers. Here's the total number required to produce, how much goes out with the grain, and then the harvest index. What that means is percent of the uptake in the grain versus the rest of the plant. And there's some key things on here. Why do we talk about potassium? Because potassium and nitrogen are needed in the greatest quantities for soybean. And we know soybean does this thing, nodulates with the Baradi rhizobium, nodules supply the end from the air, 
you dump nitrogen fertilizer out, the nodules don't develop. And so we don't typically talk nitrogen on soybean. And so we look to the next biggest need, potassium. One of the things we cannot overlook is nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur. Those are the ones that have the highest percentage ending up in the grain. What do you sell at the scales? Grain, right? So the potassium builds the biomass, builds the factory. It's still important. But if you don't have the right inputs for whatever it is you're producing, can the factory fully give the full output? So don't overlook the importance of phosphorus and sulfur for soybean yields, because that's what you're selling. And that's where, when we talk about fertility in our research, we've actually really focused on the phosphorus sulfur side, less so on the potassium, because we think they're being overlooked. Fertility on soybean, how many of you have looked at it or trialed it or on strips on the farm here and there? It's, it's difficult. It's hard to get a consistent response. So we have different sources we can use. We have different timings we can use. I understand in the fall, what do you have? More time. I mean, once the crop's off, tillage, fertilizer, but there's a lot more wiggle room. What are we having less time to do in the spring these days? Plant. And we've got faster equipment, better technology. We can move across a lot more acres more quickly. But the reality of it is our planting windows seem to be getting tighter and tighter. Right? Our research program is growing and growing, and I pl plant my plots at two mile an hour. And sometimes it's just I hope I have enough days to get them all in on time. Right? So we did look at timing of fall versus spring, phosphorus as microcentrals S10, on soybean the last four years. And so what I've got here are the last four years, the average yield, and then the fall versus spring application, this is going to be, um, we use a couple different rates, but it averages out to about 60 pounds P205. And what I'm going to show you are the first three years. So here are the yields, and I'm going to make it easy for you. Where they're in the green, they're higher than the control. Now economically, right, biologists, I don't think, you know, if this one may pay here, the four bush response here, but you'll notice they're minor increases. So the economics probably aren't there in this situation. We're going to talk about why fertilizer doesn't give us the response on soybean that we usually see on corn here in a second. Uh, and then the other thing to note, though, is we always beat with fall application over spring application. Now, we know there's a little nitrogen out there with that fall applied phosphorus source. So are we recommending fall applied phosphorus and the nitrogen? We talk about nitrate loads. That's another discussion that we can have. But one of the things that you have to remember why does, what, what is so different about planting soybean rather than planting corn? It's what you're planting into, right? So soybean is going into corn stover, no matter whether it's no-till, strip till, conventional till, a lot of residue. And one of the things that I get excited about is residue, it's gonna be something we're gonna have to really be thinking about, but if you put a little phosphorus, nitrogen, sulfur out in the fall on top of fresh corn stalks, perhaps actually we're stimulating a little mineralization and that's going to benefit, benefit us at planting in the spring for those soybean to get a more uniform emergence. Marco Sloman has been talking about this. This is where he originally started those discussions. Give credit to, to him. He's the student that thought about this. And it's something we're going to go try and measure and look at fall versus spring and the residue decomposition. But it's my theory today about why fall fertility on soybean makes sense because are you treating the beans a little bit? But you're probably also treating the residues of the corn stalks, helping them break down in the fall uh, before the winter and the hard freeze hits. All right, so it's the second time today that I've hidden something from you, and some of you are probably wondering, why is 2023 not showing up? Well, like anything in good research, you get three good years of data, and we want a fourth because it's one site before we publish. And what happens? You get the different result, right? So no matter what it was, fall versus spring, you better off to plant the beans and walk away. We planted these beans in April. Actually, these went in, I think, April 13th or 14th. Uh, in 2023. Do early beans maybe need fertility? I don't know. Or we did see a growth advantage right off the bat. You know what the problem with a bigger plant? Bigger plants use more water. And there's a really good chance when that water turned off in June, the bigger plants crashed a little harder because they were using more water, using it faster, and they ran out of water faster. And then that actually takes you downhill. So did we miss something there? Strong start but couldn't finish because of that. Still working through that, but in general, if you average it, if you're doing fertility via phosphorus or sulfur on beans, there might be an advantage to that fall application over the spring application. So now we're gonna tie fertility and foliar protection together using that planning date study. And if you look at the different yields for 2022, right? Blue bars doing nothing. Red bars, fertility alone. You notice, you know, 
We also decreased yield in 2022 on the April beans. Fungicide here, foliar protection is in green, and then the yellow is if you put them together. One clear trend tends to stick out. They're additive. So doing both of them tends to be better than either alone. And if you had to pick one, foliar protection, like I said, is our more consistent response. Uh, and then if you really break it out, here's the advantage, right? So four bushels to the system, three, six, or four. Like I said, unfortunately, in these scenarios, I don't think we paid for it. Be straight, straight up about that. Biology shows what's going on on the yield. We have to do the math to make sure it brings an ROI um, because 75 bushels without doing anything is still not a bad day, right? Sometimes in research, we've gotten really high control yields just because we planted early. And sometimes we get minor results on the, the, what we're looking at, but just something to consider. So repetition and education is everything. So I've been showing you 2022 in this study in 2023. Here's 2023. So a reminder what those bars kind of looked like in 2022. And here's 2023. Mostly the same thing. But for the most part, you can see oftentimes the orange bars and the blue bars are pretty well the same. So fungicide in 2023 with insecticide was driving our best responses. Was not fertility. Again, I think in a dry year, that fertility, if it builds biomass, then you can't get it out on the back end if you really run out of water. Um, or that just when you have slow growing soybean, maybe they don't need the fertilizer as much. I mean, this year's corn crop was real short. Our soybeans, they stalled forever. Same field, three weeks in a row. I'm like, they haven't changed. If their beans aren't growing, they're probably not using the fertilizer. If we had a more wetter year, I expect that response to fertilizer would be better. I can't predict the weather these days, so we just have to, you know, do our best. Uh, maybe we should have, these are all spring applied, I should mention that. Maybe we should apply it all out in the fall. And, but then if you look, this is interesting though. The key thing that we saw this year, later planted soybean needed the management the most. Some people might think if you're planting into cool, cold, wet soils, you probably need more management because the nutrients aren't cycling because the microbes are still sleeping. But we tend to see the opposite. The later planted soybean needs the management. Why is that? They're behind. April soybean, for those that have done it, it's scary because they're just not there, they're not there, then they're above the ground, they're moving so slow, they don't look so great, they grow very slow, but they have a longer season to do it. You plant beans in June, they're out of the ground in five days off to the races. I mean, they are screaming and they're behind. And so management probably helps them catch up. So we tend to see later planted soybean might be more responsive to management. So when you start doing the economics, if you get out early enough, you could just plant them and walk away and probably have a pretty good yield. Maybe you don't need some of the inputs. Not what we thought would happen, but it seems that early planted soybeans are pretty hardy workhorses. Just let them do their thing. And then if you break it out, we, like I said, we had 16 varieties, um, we have 15 of them shown here. And the key thing in 2023, largely, this is the positive response to management. Fungicide every time, fertility was kind of a hit or miss. I mean, if you had the right variety, 4.2 bushels, some varieties don't like fertility. So fungicide was the key protection here. I will say in general, you know, in a dry year, this was the, the driving fertility less responsive. We do tend to see you put the two together, it is synergistic in more normal years. So why is this? What's going on? One of the things that we are important and we hear a lot more about soil testing, looking at the soybean seasonal phosphorus uptake rate. Again, I gotta give credit to Marcos Lohman who really put this concept together and created these next few slides. So here is soybean developing through the season. Here's the daily phosphorus uptake of that soybean plant. And what you'll notice is there's two different phases, right? Initial growth, not much going on. You don't need much phosphorus per day, less than 0.1 pounds per acre per day of P205. But at peak uptake, which happens to be extended, a couple weeks there, you need up to 0.8 pounds of P205 per acre per day. And when we think about soil supply, on soil A, on a daily basis, that soil might be able to produce anywhere from 0.3 to 0.6 pounds of available P205 per day. Remember, soil solution replenishes itself, but it's a daily amount. And to maximize yields, you have to hit the peak uptake rate. This is an example for 60 bushel soybean. Guess what, 80 bushel soybean, they need about one pound per acre per day. And so now you have an even higher limit to catch. This is what we think is limiting yield. And this is where fertilizer has its place. This is the same story for corn. It's even more drastic because corn has a really fast uptake. Um, I think it's almost two to two and a half pounds of P205 per acre per day when you look at its peak. And so this is where fertilizer supply comes into play, supplementing the soil. But if you're on soil B, 
Sometimes you, some soils can release almost a pound of P2O5 per acre per day, and that may be why we're not seeing response to fertility. So this is why when you just take a soil test and that soil test might say, yep, this is gonna work or not, you have enough to go with, perhaps it's not that it's all there, but it's the daily availability. And that's what we're really gonna push forward in a lot of our research moving forward, is understanding the daily needs and ensuring we can get that through things like the four R's, the right rates and placements. Lastly, we're gonna to touch briefly on seed treatment. We give it two here. This is more thinking kind of the traditional Brady rhizobium, right? So soybean does this, it fixes nitrogen through the rhizobium and the nodules, and you got N2 coming out of the air and going to a usable form by plants, active exchange. We've done Brady rhizobium inoculants in our studies and see plus or minus two bushels. We've been doing corn soybean long enough in our Illinois plots, there's enough in native inoculum to do this on its own. And when we think about why they do this, they need a lot of nitrogen, about four to five pounds of nitrogen per acre per day for soybean. And they get about half or 50% of that from the nodules, the other half via the soil supply. Soybean needs four to five pounds of N per bushel. I'm not convinced, or I'm convinced that soybean yields might be nitrogen limited, but we can't pour it on via fertilizer. So maybe we need to maintain soil supply and get this up to 60%, 70%. Can we increase the fixation efficiency and we've been doing that with a little thing called molybdenum. Now molybdenum is the important for the enzyme that takes the N out of the air and puts it in usable form. You need molybdenum for that enzyme to work. So why not put it right on the seed at planting and the native Brady rhizobium now have the tools they need to do their job even better, right? Don't send somebody to do a job and don't give them any tools. Then they can't get it done. But you give them the tools, the natives, they colonize, they nodulate and they can do it. Um, here's the yields. We have uh, two different years, a two-year average that we've been working with, two different rates of seed treatment. I'll just color code it to the visual response. On average, we're getting about a two-bushel response. Now, I can tell you as an um, academic, I will never prove statistically two bushels on top of 80 without 20 replications or three sites. It's just the statistics won't, won't get that. That's really hard to detect. But if I tell a grower in four scenarios, I'm getting about a two-bushel response to a seed treatment, this does pay. And it's Pretty easy to do, treat it, put it out across the acres. So just something we just started with, the idea though, is we think we're enhancing the fixation potential because we're just giving the soils, microbe soils, the tools they need to do so. Other things of interest are these bacillus, right? So Brady rhizobium may not be doing it, but can we look at bacillus? We're doing seed treatment and, and furrow inoculation. Some success on this. We are excited about the potential, not quite ready for some commercialization, I think, but we're gonna get that answer to you. So the last thing I'm gonna to touch on, and we're gonna kinda of go through this quickly because I'm right up about on my time, but we do have Darby Danzel in the room, and she's doing cover crop management. So we've gone through the six secrets, but what's the next steps? Cover crop or double crop, right? So we did standard stock rollers or sizing on the corn. What would you rather drill your cereal rye into? This or this? The idea here is this can help us get a better cover crop stand if we're drilling after harvest perhaps helping the cover crop get off to a good start. But then you have to manage that biomass. So we have cereal rye in this example. We're adding ATS, ammonium thiosulfate, seven gallon to the acre at termination. And then we're playing around with some of the biologicals, right? So this is a living microbe to degrade residues. And this is just simple sugar and uh, humic acid, feed the natives approach. Why inoculate when we can just stimulate those already there? Um, just so you know, you put ATS in the tank, three days later I can go out and make sure Darby sprayed the right plots because I can see two of the row. Um, good job Darby, you got them all right. Um, and it just, it knocks it flat real fast, three days later. Uh, for reference, there's those bacillus that I was talking about, new products coming out of market, that's the residues, applying a living microbe. Or we're using Neovita 43, it's corn syrup, all right? And hydrohume, humic acids. Quick sugar, quick energy, probably burns up real fast. And then like a complex carbohydrate, feed the microbes for the long run, get them off to rolling, stimulate the natives. What you're gonna see are untreated control 89 bushels, right? Like I said, we're getting some phenomenal genetics these days. We lost 10 bushels to that cover crop, two things to state. I planted 75 pounds of the acre because we drilled it late and we wanted a good stand and it stood. We had a lot of biomass, two tons of biomass, a little over recommended rates, and we had a dry 22, put two tons of biomass, sucked up probably a lot of the soil moisture and dry 2023. So I would say this is probably worst case we're gonna experience first look at this system. But the cool thing was when we added these treatments, we started to get the penalty back. So we might be able to add things to the tank at termination, don't have to pay for the extra application, and at least mitigate, and I think in a more normal year, 
we may have surpassed 89 on many of these. And the key thing is it looks like the ATS is driving the response the most in this case, uh, and then you do the economics. When you look at the chopped yields, right, we did see that sizing actually reduced the cereal rice stand. We'll, we'll have some insights to that at the poster session. And they weren't as consistent, but ATS seems to be the driving factor. So if you're gonna try something at cover crop termination, maybe ATS. Um, so we have some key takeaways there on the poster. Uh, all treatments cereal rye numerically increase the yield compared to the unmanaged rye. And then there are some effects that can be an additive on a standard sizing. If you're chopping, really we found ATS was the best move to go through. So to wrap up here and conclude, here are the six secrets of soybean success. And if you add it up, what's that total? 80 bushels, right? That's what I think we're excited about. So always take your field scout to the field, though, to double check, right? So here's my field scout, Paisley. And in 2012, she's pretty happy with 60 bushels. But then we went to the next plot where we're doing some of those six wonders. We got 80 bushels. And that's something to be really excited about, right? So the secrets to high yields, make sure the planner's ready. That's the first thing. But then you have the decision to not use it. Don't forget that part. Field conditions are probably gonna be important, but like I said, there's pretty good potential with less of a risk on that, especially if you think compared to corn. Longer or maturity group tends to be the way to go. We're filling seed with foliar protection, and fertility may be best in the fall, but we tend to see if you're doing fertility, foliar protection has an advantage. So last things is, you know, 60 bushel beans compared to 80, 33% increase in our nutrient requirements. Have we been accounting for that in our soybean systems? Probably not, maybe on the potash side. But think about the amount of phosphorus, sulfur, nitrogen, micros we now need to go from 60 to 80. It's gonna change our minds about what it's gonna to take to get there. So special thanks, I apologize, I'm two or three minutes over, I think. Um, but that's what I've got for you. All right, let's thank Dr. Sybil. All right, we are a little over, but if you're willing to stick around, we could take one or two questions. And I won't be leaving until I'll be through the poster sessions too. Okay, the question was, what kind of rate for ATS with cereal rye? We're, we're putting seven gallon to the acre that gets us 20 pounds of sulfur because Sean, uh, Castile's work says sulfur on soybean about 20 pounds. So that's why we chose that rate. Yep, so the question is, in the 20s versus 30s in the planning date, do we look at every variety? Yes. If you go to our website, the entire yield report for every variety, every management, any way you can slice and dice it for both 22 and 23 are at the top. There's still links posted top of that link. Yep. Okay, one more question. Todd. So I think the question was no-till. Yep. So one thing I will clarify, and I should, these are all conventional. So no-till does change the game, especially in field conditions. That's something to consider. And then the follow-up was if you're no-till and early, should you or should you not use the foliar protection? My, when dry? Both ways. Yep. So in general, our data has found in the conventional systems, dry or wet years, foliar protection has a response. It's better in wetter years. Um, but from the economics and the IPM perspective, if there's really no disease pressure out there, that's decisions that have to be made as well. Um, but in general, we're seeing foliar protection is consistent in almost every scenario we've looked at. Great. Let's thank Connor again.